she was suddenly just Hi. there, impassive and prepared for trouble. How did she know what was about to erupt? Although she's been dead for only a decade, history now remembers Dove Falkenhand as the Martial One of the Seven Sisters because she was most often seen in leather armor and on formal occasions plate armor rather than gowns and resorted to her bow and sword first and her magic second. She was a superb archer and formidable with the sword. Some thought of her as the most mannish of the seven as she always dressed as men do and was something of a strong silent type speaking only when she had to and never using six words when five would do. Lifelong, Dove clung to the idea that magic was precious and to be used sparingly, not flung around casually to do things brawn and daily diligence could accomplish. Strike once, but strike true was one of her favorite sayings, and she detested arrogance and bluster in everyone, but rulers and mercenary leaders in particular. Verbose individuals who spouted floods of words would usually, unless she was listening to them to glean intelligence from what they might let slip, cause her to melt away into solitude or the company of someone quieter. Dove often sat in companionable silence with a fellow sister, sipping tea and awaiting the other sister to speak. Some mistook this for simple wits or something wrong, but it was merely her preference. When she needed to be eloquent and forceful when speaking at a ruling court, for example, she could be as impressive and as accomplished an actor and diplomat as any of her sisters. Yet such extroversion was not her preferred way. Only harpers and her fellow sisters know of her skill as a harpist. She never performed at taverns, but often produced a hand harp to gently weave tunes at a bedside or to guide someone through a dark forest. She could keep undead at bay by weaving spells into her harping, something she taught to a handful of harpers and her sister Storm. Ranger by profession and style, Dove walked her own way, traveling the backlands and well places of the heartlands tirelessly, righting small wrongs, doing harper work, carrying messages, items, and providing guidance and aid, and spreading mistress guidance and small items of magic, usually scrolls, potions, and written rituals and procedures. Over time, she became Azuth's main envoy when dealing with difficult wizards, those succumbing to the lure of power to use their art to oppress or overreach, and those tinkering with the most dangerous magics, as Carsus of Netheril had done of old. This made her the least high profile of the human daughters of Dornal and Elue Silverhand. The youngest daughter, Kalue Valadorn, was even less seen in human society, but was spoken of more due to her unique heritage, a drow born of a half-elf and a human father. And so, the most overlooked or underestimated. It was a common belief in the mid-1300s DR the Dove lacked the gift and had no art of her own, just an arsenal of magic items she carried. If you're enjoying this, please like and subscribe and click the little bell icon, which will let you know when my next video releases. If you'd like to see lots more videos like this, please consider going to my Patreon and becoming a protector of the realms. And you'll get lots of new realms lore and all the other cool projects I'm working on. Thanks. See you there. Dove was named Ambara for her mother's great-grandmother and Dove for a grey dove that flew into the bedchamber as she was being born and then out again. There's a rumor that it was either Mistra or Azuth wanting to be directly present at Dove's birth, but this is only a rumor unconfirmed by either deity. Dove fell in love with the ranger Florin Falconhand, an adventurer from Cormir who was one of the foremost knights of Mithdranor. She joined the knights and bore Florin a son, Azalar. 
Florin was the only love of her life, and she appears to him still on moonlit nights or whenever he's grieving, in pain, or perplexed. Dove lacked pride and ambition. She neither cared what others thought of her, nor had any personal modesty, and she wanted nothing to do with fame. She even found notoriety tiresome. She saw herself as the workhorse of the Seven, the stolid anchor and backstop to reinforce what her sisters did, and often show up as a timely reinforcement to help get them out of whatever trouble they'd gotten themselves into. Her silence and seeming absence from the political scene always made her sudden, quiet appearances at crucial moments a surprise to most. When crises and confrontations came, she was suddenly just there, impassive and prepared for trouble. How did she know what was about to erupt? The answer, of course, was that she thought ahead, did much far scrying and paying attention to many individuals, and so foresaw trends and likely reactions among rulers. If a city's guilds were building to a clash with its lord, she knew that before the break became open. If an ambitious king contemplating invasion sent out spies, she knew that too. Of called this reading the winds, and she continues to do so to this day, observing unfolding events in the heartlands as personal entertainment as well as a crucial necessity in properly serving Mistra. For upon Dove's death in battle in 1487 DR, Mistra plucked her soul into the weave so as not to lose a daughter she so loved. Dove and her dead sister Salune both live on as voices in the weave, a peculiar sort of undeath that has nothing to do with necromancy or negative energy, though the colloquial name for what Dove, Salune, and certain other fallen servitors of Mistra have become is weave ghosts. Dove and Salune can both manifest as ghostly apparitions and maintain the wits, personality, and memories they had in life. They can also, with great effort and locally draining the weave temporarily, solidify enough to grasp, carry, and move small items, rings, scrolls, and their pebbles. See their hereafter for more on these. Dove and Salune can now travel everywhere on the weave, racing along at speeds impossible for any mortal, and rise up out of altars dedicated to Mistra. To speak for her, or awe and admonish wizards or clergy, and both Dove and Salune, who has a close bond with Azuth, can do this out of Azuth's altars too. As Mistra and Azuth have other messengers, this service isn't the main work that Dove and Salune now do. Shortly after Dove's death, Mistra instructed Storm Silverhand in how to enchant pebbles to be foci for her dead sisters, a process that involved Storm's blood and tears, a tiny moat of her silver fire sacrificed in the process, and so diminishing her, and the true names and runes of Dove and Salune. Storm endowed at least six pebbles for each and gave two to each fallen sister for them to place where they desired. Salune buried one in the foundations of her destroyed hut in Shadowdale, and Dove gave one to Florin to wear in his pendant pouch. Storm retained some herself and gave one pebble tied to each to their sister, Laryl's silver hat. Upon Laryl's ascension to the open lordship of Waterdeep, an office Mr. Bod her take, Dove and Salune became ghostly, often invisible spies for Laryl, and also acted as her eyes, walking the streets of Waterdeep and its environs to see and hear unfolding events, large and small, and the daily lives of common folk, hearing and sharing the gossip that Laryl can't. So she gains a feel for public mood and experiences life despite the heavy time and workload of the open lordship. The pebbles also allow the three sisters to just socialize and they often talk through the nights as they don't need to sleep, but do need the fellowship. A spy for the Xanathar attempting to eavesdrop on their converse found himself terrified by all three of the sisters, gleefully telling him in exacting detail his own innermost secrets, misdeeds, and memories back to his childhood, and some secrets about the Xanathar that would mean his death if the Eye Tyrant ever learned he knew them. 
too. Yet even at such loquacious moments, Dove remains the quiet one. Patient and speaking seldom, but never stupid, unaware, nor abashed. Dove, as Storm once said, is our rock. She has our backs, even when we stand on her. When Dove heard that, she merely nodded and gave the merest ghost of a smile, which is how she usually smiles. Hi, welcome back to Realm Speak, where we tackle stuff about language in the realms. And this time around, we're doing this. Moon and Sun in Draconic. So if you're a dragon or you're speaking to a dragon, the sun is above fire. So it's Zvernix, which comes from Zvern, above, and Ixen, fire. Zvernix is the sun, above fire. Whereas moon, moon is night, fire. So, Thurkir is night, Ixen is fire. So, the, the resulting word we get from that is Thurknix, or nightfire, moon, Thurknix. Thurknix.